Hello, Fermi. Sir. Oh, I thought you've started. I had to rush from work because Kosinoni Bishop so sorry, Have you started? No, I'm just here. I, I all the other mics are muted. Okay, all right. So I can mute mine too. So uh Oh, we have 80 participants already. I think we can hear you, sir. Okay, all right. Uh, uh, I think we better get started. Hmm? Is Dr. Kiari there? Dr. Kiari? Dr. Carey. Good afternoon, Dr. Carey. Good evening. How are you? Dr. Carey, can you hear me, Dr. Carey? Dr. Carey, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Good afternoon. Okay, I think we better get started. Okay, we have um, 45 it's people. You, you, it's not 81 participants. Okay, 81. Oh, yes, yes. 81. So I think that's a good Before number I where we can. I think we can start. Okay, then. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the first OSN Scientific uh, Webinar. Uh, I must say this is long overdue. As a society, we should have taken the advantage of uh, the lockdown to start uh, reminding ourselves of what we should know. But even before this, we should have started something that we should regularly uh, involve ourselves with. So henceforth, we shall be having a regular webinars uh, at the moment, what we have decided to do is to be having it every two months. But as time goes on, we will review this. 
we are working with the scientific committee, the scientific committee of OSN, your society will be in charge, but I'm just introducing the first one and subsequently um, the OSN scientific committee will be in charge. It is hoped as we have mandated the OSN scientific committee to work in hand with the Nigerian Medical and Dental Council so that we can have credits, you know, for this uh, uh, webinars and this will count at the end of the year for your CMD uh, or CPD, whichever one you want to call it. Uh, so it's our hope that through the scientific committee we'll get something from the council so that we can be having credits that will come for us at the end of the year. The, there are seven, eight subspecialty committees in the OSN and it is hoped at the initial stage that we shall be having two uh, scientific, I mean the subspecialty committees to be presented at each session. And we shall be presenting, like I said earlier on that every two months. We are also working in conjunction with the uh, National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria, as well as West African College of Surgeons. And we are trying to work out something that will help us uh, disseminate information as well as training materials uh, in terms of teachings and webinars to our residents who are in training. And this will be used will carry some points for them uh, towards their exams. We are going to finalize this uh, working through the scientific committee of uh, OSN. So uh, I think uh, I may have to stop here so that we can go into the uh, lecture, proper lecture. It is hoped that we will have about 45 minutes of the lecture, then there will be uh, opportunity for us to interact after the uh, 45, 60 minutes of lecture. And maximum we're going to spend on this platform this evening it will be 90 minutes. Uh, I guarantee you we are not going to go beyond that. Uh, at subsequent meetings, we shall be discussing some other issues. Uh, announcement will be brought to you concerning your society, the Ophthalmological Society of Nigeria. Uh, I wish us a, each and every one of us a wonderful time this evening uh, as we learn about the uh, COVID-19 and the eye care. How we're going to reintegrate ourselves into a proper uh, orthopedic care without causing any harm to any of us. Uh, things will never be normal again. We are going approaching a new normal. And we need to know what this new normal is as we have to go into the post uh, COVID-19 uh, you know, sphere of our lives again. Thank you very much. Have a great time. I now hand over to the chairman of the OSN Scientific Committee, uh, Dr. Fatima Kiari to take over. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining the first OSN scientific webinar. And um, just as appropriately, the scientific committee has um, decided to make this of a topic of discussion, which is the COVID-19 and eye care in Nigeria. No doubt COVID-19 has remarkably affected us. It is um, a time of disruption whether disruption for the good or disruption for the bad. But whatever it is, what we know is that, um, as we all know, a disruption is a kind of a test and a kind of an opportunity. So we have to rise and overcome whatever it is. And as a group, as a society, we are putting our heads together to see how we can continue to contribute what we ought to contribute in our professional lives. Um, a few housekeeping before we start. Uh, I won't take so much of your time, but um, I'd like um, 
you to close all your applications. It will give you less interference when you are listening or when you are watching. And presenters at the time should please keep all other devices silent so that there won't be an incoming call or text message that will interfere. If you have any questions, type the questions in the questions and answers section as the session goes on. Uh, don't wait for the session to end before you start typing in your questions so that we can get on with the question and answer um, quickly. Uh, just before I start, I want to do a short poll, a very short one. Um, I'd like you all to please answer. Um, that will include the panelists. Can you see the poll on the screen? So if you can see the poll on the screen, just type in yes on the chat for me so that I can be sure. Yes, some people have started voting. So the first one is, do you have an outline or plan or protocol in your clinic regarding adapting your practice in this period? And the second one is, how confident are you or how informed are you to be working as a clinician in this COVID-19 period? So it's a, it's a very trying period for most of us. Some of us ran away at the beginning. Some of us are thinking of how we can engage back. And some were so brave that they said, what will happen will happen and they continued working. So how confident are you? Um, hopefully at the end of this discussion, we will see a sort of a difference maybe, I don't know. Um, the poll is going on very well. We have 72, 67% going up. Yes, thank you. We'll give a few more seconds before we end the poll. Can you please all vote? It will be interesting to see this. Thank you. So as we're going on, um, Dr. Rafindat is saying hello to everyone. <laughs> He's the PRO of OSN. So understandably, so he engages with everybody. 74% voted. Can you please carry on voting? Um, I have just about 10 seconds and I'll stop the poll because we can't wait for too long. Okay, I'm going to stop the poll now. Thank you for voting, um, 77, 78% voted. Okay, thank you. All right. So I'll just share the, the results quickly. Um, so at least 80% have a protocol or a plan and 8% uh, are just a bit confident. So every, as we can imagine, everybody is about 50% is about somewhat not sure here or there. All right, so on this note, I, I would, um, I would like to call on, um, let me see what do I do. I want to share my screen first before we continue. So that I can introduce the first speaker. So as you know, we are, we are having three speakers. We have um, three speakers and each one of them is going to be talking about different things. So the first speaker will be talking about COVID-19. What are the ethical implications regarding the duty of the patient and responsibility of the healthcare provider. So this person is Professor Abdul Kabir Ayoni. He's professor and head of department of ophthalmology at the College of Health Sciences, University of Abuja. And I'm proud to say that's my boss. And uh, interestingly, why he's speaking on this topic about ethical implications is um, we have discussed quite a number of times on this with him. Uh, and he has an MA in medical ethics and law. So he's quite conversant with the situation about patient safety, balancing with 
um, physician responsibility. So I'd like to call on Professor Ayoni. You're welcome, sir. Can you share your screen, please? And go ahead with the presentation. Can you please unmute yourself? Okay. Of we can hear you now. Society of Nigeria. Elders of Tamologist. OSN Society Committee. Senior colleagues, colleagues, my co-presenters who is data lady and my teachers. My family, friends, and all stakeholders in high heads. We are going to look at topic is to this afternoon, ethical duty for patient and healthcare provider. I hereby declare that uh, Accept contribution to knowledge world improve medical care, education, research, especially COVID 19 pandemic. No specific interest is thereby declared. So I appreciate the OSN, especially the scientific committee. Then we look at the illustration of uh, SARS coronavirus 2, as well as the, the sketch. We can see the spike protein, which uh, the viral used to attach to the host cells and take over the control of the, of the cell. Then by way of introduction, the C9 pandemic is caused by SARS coronavirus 2, which was first isolated from three people with pneumonia connected cluster of active respiratory illness in Wuhan. The incubation period is five to six days. days. Then uh, C19 is highly contagious, fearsome, and deadly. Globalization meets, as well as no compliance to guidelines, among others, F the spread of coronavirus. No Professor Ioni, to... can you share your screen, please? Do you have your presentation? At the bottom, there's a green arrow that says share your screen. And it is pursuing post disabled participant screens here. Because I'm clicking on it. Okay, it's changed now. It has been corrected. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So you put it to presentation mode. Slide. Okay. Thank you. That's correct. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Don't like I, I've uh, tried to uh, appreciate the OSM president, elders in ophthalmology, OSS scientific committee, colleagues, my family my friends, as well as uh, the stakeholder in IX here. So, I declare that uh, I don't have any interest presenting this uh, work. Then uh, I also attack the illustration of the uh, COVID-19, such so as uh, the quantitative agent of COVID-19, which is uh, severe acute respiratory uh, syndrome coronavirus 2. Uh, we can see some uh, spikes around the It looks like crown. That is where the name coronavirus uh, comes from. Then uh, we can see the spike protein, which it uses to attach the host 
cell and take over the control of the of the cells. It was uh, first reported in Wuhan, and then the incubator period range is from, from two to 14 days. We can now free to five to six days. So it's highly continued, fearsome and deadly. Globalization meets as well as non compliance to guidelines among other has kept COVID-19 to spread like a boost fire. Up to now, we don't have standard treatment. There's no cure. And then the vaccine is under development. Global millions of people have been infected. Though there we have uh, up to 1.3 million recoveries too. And then we have fed from the same infection. It has affected all Practically almost human behaviors, particularly healthcare, enforcing modification, which uh, people tag as new normal. The new normal is not necessarily ethical, as anecdotes, social media, and tabloids are what we need and alleged infractions. So we are going to attempt to highlight the ethical duty uh, for patients and healthcare providers in C19. So we and uh, now we have a number of uh, words of risks that are popular, including lockdown, organic uh, products, citromycin, and was in quarantine among others. So you are you agree with me that the world is a state of grief. And then the uh, you know, we have five stages, denial, many people are still denying that there's no COVID-19. Some people are really angry, really angry. That uh, the, the, as the friend of food, we see that uh, President Trump is especially angry with China. Those who have been, uh, uh, if you, God, if you allow me to, if you kill me, if you kill me, if you allow me to die, I will build the cathedral. I will send as many people for Hajj during this Hajj. There's a lot of depression. Then acceptance. I don't know whether the world will accept COVID-19. Then uh, or the objective of this discourse to highlight the moral obligation of individual uh, with uh, SARS. Coronavirus to a healthcare provider. So, specific objective, we are going to look at uh, what are the duty of individual with uh, COVID as well as healthcare facility. The concern, we are going to look at ethics duty, individual with COVID. We are going to examine ethics. Ethics, by way of uh, introduction, is a Greek word, ethos, and then Latin word, most, which means custom. Ethics is a norm, custom, tradition, as well as morality of a group or community. Ethics is a systematic analysis of what it means to lead a decent life. Duty is an obligation to do something for moral, legal, or remedial reason. A task or service allocated to someone, especially in the course of work, can also be regarded as duty. You know, we have common duty. Uh, we have specific, specific duty. If a child is about to cross the road and an uh, adult is around, and the road so that uh, it will not be done, you can call that one common duty. But specific duty, people are trained to perform, to carry out specific duties. Then action is right if we uh, bring desirable consequences, that the consequences is that. Uh, Position where yeah, the autology access is right if it is a duty. Then when let's look at the duty of patients. Patients are individuals who receive medical treatment. They have capacity to pacify or wait. Then individual with COVID-19 uh, is the subject of this course this afternoon. They can be symptomatic or not. Then what are the duty expected of them? These who are spreading C19 uh, to neighbors. Who are the neighbors? We'll see them shortly. This will be true, true to healthcare professionals.
you know, we, the tabloid is awash with a number of uh, healthcare professionals being infected because those patients, they don't come out to tell them their, their history, their recent past history, whether they just arrived from elsewhere from abroad or they just, they, they have nurse or in contact with positive, seropositive uh, CNA patients. There's also a point self-medication. This is dangerous because uh, many people end up having complications from infant self-medication. In fact, uh, the health minister, uh, Dr. Enahire, was, uh, was in the punch today where he was saying that somewhere to do educated Nigerians, they hide themselves, they were receiving home treatment, they don't come out to, to tell the people to go to the uh the the places already designated for treatment they end up uh, either dying or causing more complications for themselves so they should seek care promptly and obey the guidelines for c19 and incorporate fully with the c19 treatment protocol they should avoid any healthcare professionals about uh, some days in Kano, there was a report in the Nigeria newspaper that patients uh, on isolation, they lock up the professional for hours. It's like they are having, they should not do that, it's on the car. Then they should grant informed consent as necessary. Then uh, the healthcare professionals. So we can see beautiful doctors here, and then a very handsome nurse here. So the healthcare professionals are necessarily as far will provide healthcare services. Patients consult them for their services based on trust. Usually they work as a team. Then what are their duties? Sorry, Professor Ioni, your audio has gone off. It looks like um, you're frozen. Are you still there? So the duty of the healthcare professional again they should stay safe and not spread COVID-19 to contacts. Contact can be their patients, their immediate family member, their friends. Seek treatment if infected with uh, C-19. They should follow proper guidelines and procedure. They manage uh, the patient. By managing patients, they should cancel them, you know, because uh, we have various roles. We can cancel. We can refer or treat if we are among those people that are the front line. Though that front line, you know, this uh, there are a lot of discourse or argument or who is even a front line uh, healthcare professional during this uh, scourge. Deploy experts truthfully to the individual with uh, COVID 19. They should also try to improve on and maintain individual with COVID 19 awareness through client center care. They should show what is known as affordance behavior. What do I mean by affordance behavior? You know, some, uh, some healthcare professional, because they know something is contagious, they would rather stay away. Then they should not try to be hero. There's no heroism in this kind of uh, condition because the natural issue of COVID 19 is not fully understood. So nobody should try to be hero. They should seek out uh, informed consent from the patients when necessary. And then they should 
and themselves in really far research. So establish good patient care differ relationship. They should be clear and consistent. This is also in so accurate and prominent topics, and then this also will be constituted authority. He's just doing whatever he likes, like uh, it is clear. Nigeria position is clear that uh, people should not treat COVID 19 patients in the private clinic, it's part of obeying the constituted authority because it has been shown that uh, transmission in the private clinic in, is more. It's more and then the spread is great. Then they should not disclose information considered to be psychological detriment to the senior. That's what we call a, a therapeutic privilege. Let your professional have that. If you feel that information you are releasing to, the, to your patient can be psychologically detrimental to the outcome, you can withhold that uh, information. Then they should advise individuals to prevent spread to contacts. This is very, very important. Then there's one third parties of there's one them ahead that okay this person is having COVID 19 like parents now if if a, if a father or a mother is having COVID 19 there should be a way of explaining to the children so that they will, they will not feel bad or spouse so that they know that okay this have to be isolated from them for some time. Then um, they should also maintain COVID-19 confidentiality. I know many maintain confidentiality. It's very important so that you don't have what uh, can be described as said. Uh, then they should get relevant training, which is very important. Then uh, they should use also the producer experience, uh, experience of threats to help whenever there is any war. So look at a care facility. So this is a big, beautiful picture of one of our health facilities in the country. So health care facility, they, they, they provide support and uh, resource, either for clinic, then safety. We look at the safety. The health care facilities to train health care workers. This will also provide what we call uh, infection prevention control as well as personal pro protective equipment. In fact, for the individual with, uh, with the condition, they should also protect them because some of them, they may want to commit suicide. Some of them, they may want to injure co-patients. We have, we, have, we have cases like that. So it's the duty of a care facility to protect then the physical security should be provided to guide the property of the of the patient while they are admission then uh, they should also make sure that they properly dispose the waste either solid or liquid waste everybody know what happened when the undertaker one of the undertakers during the barrier of uh, the late uh, chief of staff to president the way it disposed the 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 offeror, you know how it has caused a lot of discussion in our social on our social media. So there should be proper disposal of waste, so that the scavenger will not go and take them and then also spread the the virus. They, 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 they should provide incineration of all this uh, waste that is being generated from. Either as a research center or on the people that are using them during this pandemic. Then space, they should provide space for testing. That's what they call co-holding area. When the patients they first come, they they, they try to screen them maybe by using the thermometer to detect whether their temperature is very high or from the symptoms. So those that are suspected, they are accommodated somewhere, the sample is taken from them. And pending the results, the release of results, they will be at that holding area. Those that are positive, they will send to isol for isolation and treatment. All those spaces should be available to be provided by HCAC uh, uh, facility. 
then we fear for the healthcare professional who are involved in the treatment. This, that thing, because it's not good, it's not advisable for them to be going, to be coming from home to the isolation center. They can easily uh, spread the virus or go and infect their uh, loved ones. They should provide food for them. They should also treat them, isolate, give them of duty, and treat them if per child they are accidentally infected. Material testing facility, safe equipment, palliative or curative molecules. We have uh, acetomycin, hydroxy, chloroquine, and then you have uh, Madagascar organic. All are not curative for now. They should provide those one vitamin C. The personnel, they should provide medical team. Then there should be appropriate staffing in appropriate mix. Leadership, there should be clear of nanogram. Who, who, who should do this? Who should do what? We have to, are we going to take instruction? There should be policies. Protocols and guidelines for COVID 19. Then, there's, then there should be effective communication. Don't leave the health care facility, should not leave the health care worker in communication. They should be talking to them, they should be giving them the next uh, uh, medical insurance allowance. Direct the facility should, should be to have indemnity. There's what we call vicarious liability when the healthcare worker, maybe they are negligent of their duty, maybe inadvertently, then the hospital, the healthcare facilities will be able to be responsible. Though in Nigeria, Health Act, it is well stated there that when healthcare professional, maybe intentionally or maybe out of his uh, well, carelessness, Maybe now uh, is negligent of the duty. The hospital may have uh, some uh, compensation to, to share part of the compensation they are paying to the uh, to the patients or whoever through the hospital. Then there should be like, especially those that are frontline workers because the condition is is somehow dangerous. And uh, so that uh, they, will, they will know that in case uh, they die or anything, uh, maybe a uh, disability, they have the compensation for their maybe dependent or something like that. That one will provide a lot of incentive. The asset allowance generally for the because those that are not info at the isolation center, because of asymptom, they are about some uh, communications. Uh, those that are not in that, they, they can also be infected too. So research, there should be- Papa, I'll give you two, I'll yes. give you one minute to round up, please. Okay. Sorry to interrupt, yes. Drop Why should care professional manage individual with COVID-19? That's what we call implied consent. You enter medical school, you fill the form, you fill them. It, what you are saying is that whatever the liability or the asset in medicine, you are going to uh, abide by it. That is what I can tell me. Expect consent. The hospital before appointment, they ask you to sign some documents. They offer you and they will say, want you to accept the offer. It's like express consent. And then in that letter, they will tell you that uh, you are so, to do this, to provide clinical services, or maybe uh, then to carry out some duties as directed by the, your employer, something like that. So you now sign. That is form of express consent. Then professional codes, the declaration of Geneva, Hawaii, Tokyo, Oslo, all those declarations, if we go through them, we will see that to lot themselves. And there's a lot of simplicity. Many of us, or most of us, we went to public institution, primary, secondary, tertiary education, where that the, it is public, from the public money. We One get minute, a grant. Sam. 
to do one thing. Maybe you give me five minutes more. We get grant to do many other things. Then we supposed to give back to society. Then specialized training. If I train as infectious specialist, if I train as anesthetist, if I train all those those people, I think now they should be able to showcase their expertise. Though we should provide for them what is known as personal protective equipment. We don't we don't just ask them. So those are some of the ethical reasoning, though they are not absolute. That uh, then the uh, ethics. We are beneficent, do good for the for the others. No. So, one, not between the two. So, but what is in the, the harm, then autonomy. All the patients to be given what we call, uh, they should be able so when we give them information, they should be able to uh, receive it, analyze it, process it, and then come with their own decision. So that is on justice. If we are going to carry out uh, some uh, drug trial, are we going to impose all the body of the participants or we are going to uh, share the body as well as the benefits, if we offer the generations? something like that, then we have to take out of the right, human rights, and then the prevailing law in the environment where they saw this thing. Fidelity, our word is to abide by it as professional consequentialism. Uh, this uh, very sound ethical listening, though there's no time to discuss all this, uh, the, 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 but what consequential is all about is that we want to give maximum benefit to greatest number of people. Then the, the ontology, uh, then uh, we have uh, some maxims. The two that are very relevant. What I'm doing now, can I to be doing it? It means to an end. They should be able to treat them as an end themselves. Factuate it. It represents all what is good. So people will do what is right, not for not because of what they are going to get. You can say it's a factual thing. That's what uh, Aristotle called you the monogenon, which is flourishing life. If you want to have flourishing life, once you imbibe the factor of honesty, truthfulness, courage, all those things, we should have them a, doc a doctor, then confidentiality. So I just disclose everything about my genetic patient to everybody, confidentiality. I think it's also to, to, be, to, to keep in confidence all those things, except a few occasions, maybe uh, when the patient, the patient is going to be injured or is going to constitute no sign to the public, then if the patient, uh, if the doctor is enjoyed by the law court, to disclose it. So those are some of the... Then, let me quickly come. However, within the risk limit, the of care has historical and legal background as a shrine in professional codes, codes national acts, and consider really help in controlling C19 pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof, for this very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to call on Professor 
Adeola Onokoya. She's the professor and head of department of ophthalmology at uh, College of Medicine, University of Lagos. She is going to describe <clears throat> the different, you know, the summarize the national and international guidelines on eye care in the period of COVID and give us some of the salient points of adapting your clinical eye care service in the para COVID period. You're welcome, ma'am. Um, good afternoon, Fatima. Good afternoon, senior colleagues and colleagues and other stakeholders, other healthcare workers who have joined us this afternoon. I'll be speaking on national and international guidelines, adapting your clinical eye care services for the para COVID-19 period. Just to say that I have nothing to disclose Nothing, no disclosure. And as a matter of introduction and a reminder that the first reported in that case of COVID-19 in Nigeria actually arrived Lagos from Milan on the 27th of February, 2020. And with the report of the index case on 27th of February, that was met with a lot of um, fear. And at GNSI Center in Lagos, we then started out outright from that 27th of February by providing alcohol rubs, disinfectants to everyone, including our patients and also for staff. And the staff were, um, we were wearing uh, face masks and gloves. That was all we were doing. And we were still running full services. And this continued until about the 23rd of March when there was that sudden surge in the number of people that were infected in Nigeria. And that was a clarion call to us because to us, that was an indication of community transmission, looking at the number, the way the number just multiplied. And then it was imperative for us then to change our services. We scaled down clinical services to just emergent and urgent cases and all our surgical cases were postponed or some were outrightly canceled. So we were then running what is now regarded as new normal. So you could see the, you can see the pictures there. They, at the entrance of the facility, we have water there for our patients to wash their hands. And at the same time, temperature is checked. And then the attending physician or the ophthalmologist, we are done the theater down because we don't have the full PPE the actual PPE, but we were able to adopt the theater gown. And then we've got our face shield and um, the face mask. And that is the way we were rolling. Now with that increase in number, we then also shut the back door and we were able to control the inflow and outflow. And at that particular point in time, we decided to stop procedures that are rather too close, too close for comfort like direct fundoscopy or doing Perkins applanation to no metric. Now, we also then had this as our protocol in the department, you know, just a highlight of what we do, elected, uh, just elective cases canceled, and we were only attending to emergencies and urgent cases like ROPs and retinoblastomas and post-operative cases. And at that point in time, everyone would come to work with face masks. And at the same time, we also reduce the number of staff coming to work. For, for us, we were doing like once or twice a week for the consultants and then the residents were distributed into various groups. And of course, there was also the hospital and policy protocols to guide. And then the federal government's rule of compulsory stay at home also helped us a bit in reducing the number of exposures we have to patients. And also we were practicing social distancing. And then you would ask me, why such an aggressive measure at the very early stages? We all know that 80% of sufferers of COVID-19 are asymptomatic carriers. And these are a group of people that could, they can easily transmit or transfer the infections to you without you knowing. We know of Lin Wenlang, that ophthalmologist in Wuhan, who unfortunately succumbed to COVID-19. He contacted it from an asymptomatic glaucoma patient whom he attended to in the clinic. 
And we thought if that could happen, it could happen anywhere. And of course, we also have a lot of evidence from publications. This publication on characteristics of ocular findings showed that a third of the patients in their facility had ocular anomalies, that is those who had COVID-19. And another one also showed that majority of the patient had conjunctival congestion as early symptoms, meaning these people could present at the eye clinic. And the third one is also that there were actually patients who only had conjunctivitis as the sole presenting sign and symptoms of COVID-19. So you'll agree with me that it's imperative to us as ophthalmologists that we really have to exercise a lot of caution. And we also have anecdotal reports of higher incidence of patient doctor transmission amongst ophthalmologists because we are very close to our patients. And also to say that worldwide, we have a report that 20 ophthalmologists have died till date. So indeed, it's an existential crisis that we really need to move. Now, this is a map showing the distribution of COVID-19 in Nigeria. This was 17th of May. And you would notice here that Lagos really bears the brunt with 2550. As of today, that figure is even higher. So Lagos as the epicenter is another reason why we have been aggressive. Till date, which is 13th week to the day that we first had the first um, case of COVID-19 in Nigeria, we have a total confirmed cases of 6,401. And you can imagine Lagos State, 43%, with 2,755 cases. So that's another reason for us. Look at this graph. If you look up here, this is for Nigeria. The graph keeps going up. As Dr. Uh, Professor Anyoni said, is one of our vocabulary, flattening the curve. Now, this curve is not being flattened. If anything, it keeps ascending. And even though the positivity rate is 17.5, but we still have a quite, quite a lot of cases adding every day. And this pie chart is just showing the distribution in our different geopolitical zones. You can see that Southwest is really bearing the brunt of COVID-19 in Nigeria, followed by Northwest, then Northeast and North Central. So for that reason, we have decided to really take the bull by the horns. Now, federal government came up with the easing of lockdown. And then we were thinking, should we reopen or not reopen? Well, reopening of services actually should be dependent on the curve being flattened. Now, is this so? Looking at this graph, it's actually just going up. This is the number in Lagos, the top graph. You can see the number just going up and up and up. So in Lagos, we are not ready. Now this is for other states together. You can see all the other states together. This is Lagos State, and then this is um, Kano, and this is Abuja. So you can see that there's really nowhere where we are doing very well with flattening the curve. So with the curves not flattened, there is then a need for us to have strict protocols and guidelines in running our services. And then for us to have guidelines and protocols, this will be dependent on one, the local pattern of disease, that is the incidence, the number you have each day. And you'll agree with me, not one cap fits all. Lagos number is different from Ibadan's figure. Ibadan's figure or your state is different from what they have in the East. In fact, in the Eastern Nigeria, they have very low figures. So we cannot do the same. And also, we, it's also dependent on government rules and regulation, institutional policies, and then availability of the personal protective equipment, and also the testing availability. Testing availability of 2,000 a day. So far, we've only done 38,500 tests in Nigeria. So you'll agree with me that that is low. Now, before we go on to the specific protocol, there are some, what I call the generic protocol, which is factual for all of us. Number one, that all of us should be doing is triaging. We need to continue to triage our patients. You must ask for history of cough, sore throat, fatigue, loss of taste, loss of smell, temperature, you still have to check at the entrance of the facility. 
And then patients with breathing difficulty or those who've had contact with COVID-19 patients in the last two weeks. Hand disinfection is still paramount. Patients must wash their hand. Even everybody, including the staff, you must wash your hand. You must sanitize your hand. Your temperature must be checked. And of course, social distancing, we should not be too close. Now the waiting room, you ask me, how do we decongest our waiting room? It's very easy. Allow only the patients in. And then you have to work on the number of patients you have at a particular time. Meaning you have to give scheduled appointments, either staggered appointment or timed appointment. Of course, you have to keep line of communication open, call your patients. Now you can see here in our waiting room, the nurse there was doing the triage. You can see the distance between the nurse and the patient. We actually had to cut down our patient to about 20% capacity for now. And of course, the appropriate PPE, I said appropriate PPE, we're not wearing the white PPE, the hazmat suit, but at least we still have this. You can remove it from the back forward without necessarily contaminating yourself. And then you've got your gloves on. And then we have the face shield. We've got the face mask. What else do we want? Now, in the consulting room, what happens? Of course, you have to reorganize your consulting room. Make sure you have enough space between the consultant and or the attending physician and the patient. This is more than two meters. You have to reorganize, you have to rearrange. And the patient must come into the facility with face mask. And um, you also have to still practice social distancing and hand disinfectants in all the rooms. What about the procedures that we do? A lot of our procedures are too close for call. Now you want to do fundoscopy, direct fundoscopy, that is a no-go area. You want to do Perkins handheld applanation tonometry, no-go area for now. So you might have to invest in eye care tonometer. And if you insist on using Goldman tonometer, then you have to sterilize the tonometer head after each use with 70% alcohol, or you change it outrightly. Now, air puff tonometer, there's a lot of debate on that, that it is actually generating aerosol. So there's still controversy about uh, air puff tonometer. And then what about the dilating drops that we use? Our patients sit in one room, they get their eyes dilated. We need to do that with a lot of caution. If you touch the eyelid with a bottle, you need to sanitize, 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 sanitize. We should not turn ourselves to the epicenter of COVID-19 by transmitting infection from one patient to the other, or even infecting ourselves. And of course, we also have to regularly disinfect our slit lamps after each use, also the perimeter machine, and face mask must be worn by whoever is doing all this disinfection, because sometimes there may be some aerosolization. And we are also to examine our patient promptly, no time wasting, no time for socializing, limit your exposure, limit your contact time, and exercise precaution when you are doing the seat lamp. Instruct your patient not to say anything until after you've gone back to your seat. Before you go on to the seat lamp, tell the patient, I do not want you to talk whilst I'm examining you. When I finish, we can continue from where we stop. And then we will have also to give extended appointments for routine cases. Those cases you don't have to see every month. Give them routine extended appointments. And then there may also be need for us to increase the workforce to match the increased workload. Because of the lockdown, we now have a lot of backlog. We may have to think of extending the stay of our residents who have finished their residency program. That is one thing we are doing at Luth. Our residents have been given six months extra you know, to spend in the system. And of course, it's important for us to open up the line of communication. Now we then go to the specifics. Of course, you have to be aware of the number in your environment. It's important. We can see that Lagos, especially uh, the Southwest, especially Lagos, we are really the epicenter. We are the one bearing the brunt of COVID-19 in Nigeria. Are we at the peak of the infection? I would say no. Is the testing capacity adequate? I would say no. So are we actually also prepared for a second wave? Two weeks ago, People went out and from then on, the number climbed up to 380, 200 and 280. We've been having it in hundreds and hundreds. And within two weeks, 
we went from 2,000 to 6,000. So you can see that we really have to be prepared. Now that was clinical. What about surgery? Some people are eager to go back to surgery, but I want to warn us that before you go back to surgery, you must be guided by these four factors. And the four factors are, you must be aware, you have to take into consideration your level of preparedness, you must take into consideration patient factor, and of course, the quality of care you are going to give that patient if you go into this surgery at this time, at a time like this. Now, with regards to awareness, what do you need to be aware of? We've talked about the numbers, we've talked about the rates. You must know what is happening in your locality, in your environment. What is the testing capacity for your patients? We may have to go, you know, this is the new normal, paradigm shift. Our patients may need to go for COVID-19 tests before we do surgery for them because we don't know much about coronavirus. It may actually be in the aqueous humor. So who knows? So you may want to screen your patient. You may want to do the COVID-19 test. Some people may tell me it is not readily available. Yes, but we can do the IgG, IgM test. That has been suggested. If IgM is high, that is, you know, at least it tells you something is happening. And you can then add that to the clinical signs or the history of the patient. What about isolation? What isolation mandate do you have in your locality? Are there beds? And then the number in your locality, is it going down? And if the number is going down, it must be consistent for 14 days before you go on to start preparing to resume surgery. What about the level of preparedness? There must be adequate and appropriate PPE for protection for all staff, all staff, doctors, nurses, the housekeepers, everybody that works in theater in the operating room. And then the hospital capacity is important and capability in terms of bed, the ICU, the ventilators, because you never can tell post-surgery anything could happen. And adequate staffing and supplies for operating room is important. You must have a supply enough for 30 days before you go in to start surgery. And you must prepare for regular disinfection after each case. Still continuing on the preparedness. Of course, some of our procedures are aerosol generating. I'm sure Dr. Derrida will tell us about this with regards to FECO. Now it is known if you put HPMC or you reduce the incision size, you may not really generate aerosol. And of course, you really have to work with other stakeholders, the other ancillary staff, the anesthetists, the nurses, CSS, the labs, the imaging de department, the engineering department, they must be ready before we open our doors for our surgical cases. And you also need to have in place a committee, the governance committee, and this will be a multidisciplinary body. And what is it? They will be making the decisions. And that decision will be guided by data. It will be data driven. And what are they going to do? They're going to take care of the efficiency, look at the efficiency, look at what you're doing, the complication rates, and looking at the number in the community. If the number goes up, then there may be a need for us to step back. And of course, we also need to have contingency plans what if we have a resurge in the number? What if we have new staff infections? What are we going to do? Now, because of the heavy workload, the staff may become overwhelmed. And then you have a lot of stress, you have a lot of fatigue, you have emotional, uh, emotional problems amongst the staff. We need to prepare for that. And then work short, work, workforce shortages must be prepared for. And of course, support for staff with young children. What about patient factors? You need to open a line of communication. You must have a telephone that patient can contact you with. And of course, we need to counsel our patient. You need to reassure them that in this period, don't worry, we would not infect you. You will not go away with a disease that you don't have before coming into the hospital. And of course, our testing policy, we have to be firm on that. NHS discovered that 20% of COVID-19 patients in the UK actually contacted the infection from hospital staff. So we also have to test our staff. We have to be prepared to do that before we opened up our theaters. And we also need to prioritize procedures. 
You don't just put any case in here now. Cases that are not necessary, they can wait. And of course, PPE, cloth mask for all patients, you must let the patients know that you must come to the hospital with your mask. And you must let them know that at this period, we are not taking in family members. Only one family member to accompany you. And of course, we will reassure on safety and also discuss the post-discharge care and follow up with the patient. And of course, last but not the least, you want to talk about the quality of care that you're going to give in the theater. And that starts from the pre-operative period to intra-operative, to operate and, and then post immediate post-operative and uh, the post-operative period at discharge. So all this we need to take into consideration. Look at all the factors that could cause problems at that level. Of course, we have to practice safe surgery where the risk against benefits of what you're doing at this point in time. And of course, strict adherence to PPE guidelines, we must stand by. And then we need our theater. You must have controlled laminar air flow. Of course, good ventilation at this time, you must have a way of working that into your theater. And of course, high value care from pre-op to post-op. Now, I tell you that with the measures that we have put in place at Guinness High Center Lagos, currently, none of our staff has exhibited any symptom or tested positive to COVID-19. We thank God for that. And we continue to observe the strict protocol of hand wash, use of sanitizer, and we are still triaging our patients. Social distance in all our interactions, and then use of available PPE and face shield. And at the same time, keeping the line of communication open to our patients. So finally, my colleagues, I will implore us to treat every patient as a potential COVID-19 case. And the need for us to notify infection control departments in our institution for any case that we suspect, it's immaterial if we think or the patient says I'm negative. And of course, there's need for us to regularly evaluate our processes and the need for teamwork. We all need to work together at this point in time for us to succeed. And we should be ready to mitigate whenever the figures rises. And also it's important for us to obey the state or national executive orders of lockdown, of restriction, whatever orders they have given us, we must be ready to go by it. And I will close by um, reading out this quotation from AAO.org. It says, all other factors, business, finance, inconvenience are all remotely secondary. This is an existential crisis. We as physicians must respond to it and support our colleagues and communities. Be safe. I thank you for your attention. These are my references. And thank you very much, Prof, for this um, brilliant presentation as usual. I'd like to um, just go ahead and call on um, Dr. Olufemi Oderinlaw. Um, where is my slide now? Uh, Dr. Olufemi Oderinlaw is a vitreoretinal specialist. He is the current um, chief medical director of I Foundation Hospital in Ikeja. Hello. Um, so he will be talking to us on the practical steps, the disruption of his eye care service and how he was able to adapt and overcome the challenges. Specifically, it's going to be a step-by-step -step practical, what he has done to overcome the challenges. And um, for those of you that know, I Foundation is a public private hospital in Ikeja, Lagos. Public because it does a lot of community um, uh, partnership and it's um, private because it caters for uh, top end ophthalmology. So it will be interesting to know how they are able to overcome this very interesting period. Dr. Oderindo.
You're welcome, sir. Yeah, Can you thank share you. your screen? Thank you. Yes, thank uh, you. It's there. Thank you. Um, um, my senior colleagues, Professor Nokoya, Professor Ioni, um, uh, all protocols duly observed. I just to make a quick uh, correction, I'm not the chief medical director. <laughs> I'm just medical director of the Kedja. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> it's okay, man. So unfortunately, we as retinal surgeons, we have the unfortunate, uh, I won't call it a privilege, that many of the ophthalmic emergencies fall on our laps. So rightly taking off from what Professor Nokoya presented, um, after all the happenings, we have scaled down our practices to take emergent cases. However, um, retinal detachments, which are emergent cases, um, COVID has not stopped them. They are still coming. And according to all international protocols, we, we are still taking them. So we've had to handle a few of these cases. And I'll just share with us how we have been doing it, trying our best to keep very safe. So a number of challenges have been outlined by other, other presenters, uh, patient flow management, prevention of infection, transmission among patients and doctors, which is very important, uh, finance staffing and budgeting, consumables, equipment, maintenance and everything. So there's, there's a huge financial loss in the states within the period of four weeks that was analyzed by um, the analytics of hospital management, over $60 billion have been lost. Most of the loss is in ophthalmology. Cataract surgery has reduced by more than 97%, glaucoma by more than 88%. However, when we look at the, um, the analytics again done, done uh, for Nigeria, um, maybe a little bit of a good news, we are expecting that when everything is clear, I'm also in the same school of thought with Professor Nokoya that the, the road is not clear for us to go back to full, uh, full clinics and go back to the previous normal. For many reasons, the testing is not adequate. The figures we are seeing are an underestimation. They are definitely more than, than what we are seeing. So, so it's, it's not yet time. The curve is nowhere near flattened at all. However, in the, when we look at most of the sectors in the country, we, we, the, uh, the, there will be big losses in hotels, leisure, entertainment, airlines, breweries. In fact, it said that many of them definitely will be needing in government intervention to be able to, to take off. But hopefully that might not be the problem with them. With healthcare, and healthcare can rebound because it means eventually, when the doors are open, people who have their their health problems will come forward. So that's when the management really will start because we'll be having to deal with patient volumes. It's either going to go in two ways. In the early period, not many patients will come out, but when things get stable, a lot of patients will start coming out. So we have to deal with patient volumes, crowd control. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways we've tried to do it, right now we're probably at about 20, 15 to 20% of um, what we used to do before because we're only taking emergent cases. But what we've done is to create a telemedicine platform we send to all our patients so that if they have any questions, they can actually meet uh, with doctors or have a Zoom call with their doctor and they can discuss their concerns. Also, I mean, definitely many of the patients too don't want to come to the hospital, but at least we're able to offer them this service to keep them, I mean, if they want to replace their medication, we, we, we let them know how they can get the medication, especially glaucoma patients that are stable on medication. You don't want them because of this period to go out of control and then when they come back, you have to deal with it. So those are things that we're doing. For patients who have definite appointments, for definite problems. We let them know what to expect when they are coming to the hospital, payment options. We try to let them do as much as they can do outside the hospital. If they are going to pay for anything, they can pay and um, our, our team is able to guide them to what, what they can do. Um, so the, the main problem here, which has been outlined by, by uh, the other presenters, is the fact that asymptomatic people are actually transmitting this disease. 
if it was based on symptoms, then probably we'll just be home and dry. If you don't have a cough, you are okay. But a lot of people who are not symptomatic at all, they, they, they are able to transmit the, the viruses. And there are a lot of studies that have found the virus in the conjunctiva in tears and um, in the preocular tear film. Um, however, the summary here is that the COVID virus has been cultured from the preocular tear film. Viral RNA has also been found in, um, a lot in, the, in several others. Most patients that had this, they had clinically evident conjunctivitis at the time that the virus was isolated from their eyes. This is a summary I'm taking from the advisory from the American Academy. Now, we must also remember that the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. And what that means is that because we cannot particularly say that this, these viruses were only where it is only transmitted when there's conjunctivitis, we cannot say that other times it's not transmitted. We also don't have a particular evidence that there's intraocular multiplication replication of these um, of this, uh, viruses as of this time, but we have to be cautious. So every patient that comes in is taken as having COVID until proven otherwise. So at least we can get the symptoms. We can make sure that they check their temperature, hand washing before coming into the facility at all. So we have hand washing stations provided outside. We check the patient's temperature. We take a brief history outside before they come into the, into the hospital doors where we have a series of questions as advised by the, uh, the disease control center that we ask them. Now we also ask patients in the messages we send to them, we let them know that they, they should not come with a lot of relatives. If possible, no relatives at all. So we let only the patients come in. Every other person goes to sit in their car or they sit in, a, we have just one or two sitting areas outside the front of the, of the, um, of the hospital where they can see. And we, we examine, I mean, we take their temperatures, we make sure everybody is wearing a face mask as is advised by the disease control. Of course, our waiting rooms, we're probably able now to use about 20, 25 to 30% of the capacity of our waiting rooms. We label them so that patients don't sit on the, on the areas. Now for doctors, it's recommended that um, we, doctors should wear surgical mask and eye protection. And um, where available, um, a full PPE uh, when looking at patients. So um, I have this, this um, screen. It's not a full screen, but it gives a full cover over the, the face and with my face mask. This is, this is just for um, talking with patients. When it's time to examine patients, is advised that you, you put on your full, uh, actually for the indirect ophthalmoscope, I will also be wearing gloves. And it's not that one wears the glove all day, you wear it per patient. Per patient, you examine the patient, you take off the glove, you wash your hands. And in between each, um, each clinic, um, each time you see a patient, you are going to clean the whole, the slate lamp, um, you are going to clean everything. There are these um, slit lamp shields. They are commercially available, but also we can, uh, what we did, because all our slit lamps have slit lamp shields, and um, the A5 Perspect size paper. It is, this is an A5 Perspect size, and um, it can be cleaned, it can be washed, and it can be, it can be disinfected. So we have this on all our slit lamps. We have face shields for, for all the staff. I was saying that it looked like exactly like the same face shield that Dr. Nokoya was showing for, for Lutu. I'm guessing that somebody is chopping all our money. <laughs> We're all buying for the same, from the same person <laughs> and it's feeding fats. Okay, as long as we remain alive, we don't mind if it's feeding fat. So cleaning the slit lamps with two solutions, alcohol with at least 70%, um, dilute bleach about 10%. When we come to the tonal 
micrometers, as rightly mentioned, the air puff is a microsol dispersing um, so equipment. It's advised that we avoid using it. Um, cleaning with alcohol is, is good for SARS-CoV-2. It's good. But the disadvantage with alcohol is that it doesn't effectively um, control adenoviruses. And um, the bleach, the bleach too, is, um, is equally safe and uh, um, acceptable. But the best advice is to use single use disposable tonometer heads. You use one and you throw it away. That is if it's available. We don't have actually. So I must make that confession. So what, what we do is that we, we, we have, we alternate them. So this is, it's inside um, hypochlorite. And when you are using one, the second one is here and you can um, change it when you are, you are through. Um, use gloves, of course, for all those procedures and remove the glove after every patient and dispose it. So, so we're using a lot more disposables now, so, so many things. And also that means that we are generating waste and we also have to pay attention to how to dispose the waste. I will advise that the solutions, the tonometers should not be left in the solutions for too long because uh, what we've also found is that it, it tends to erode gradually the, the tip, either alcohol or hypochlorite. Both of them do the same thing. So um, we should also uh, be aware of that. Um, I think we should put our direct of thermoscope, we should send the, the direct of thermoscope on a sabbatical leave for now, because I don't know how we are able to, to ensure social distancing with the direct of thermoscope. This is the indirect. So I will be wearing my, my face um, protection and also a screen on the indirect when I'm doing my indirect. And then with the 90D, um, there's a slit lamp screen. There's also a face screen that I'm putting on when I'm doing my indirect. For procedures, mostly we've not done a lot of uh, visual fields. We've reduced it. In fact, I don't think we've done any for quite some time. Um, because it's not really so emergent, and most of our patients that are on glaucoma medications, we have uh, maintained them. But should one need to use any of this um, equipment, there are strict cleaning um, guidelines that are available on, this is the ZEIS HFA. If you go to their website, you will see the cleaning guidelines. It's a little bit um, elaborate. So what we've done is we've gotten our technician to teach to teach the, um, the medical photographers that, that work with us how to clean it when it needs to be done. And the same goes for the fundus photograph and any of the other. Um... So the other point here, the multi-dose eye drops that we use, the best now right now to do is to use the single, a single eye drop per patient, especially the minims. You, if, you have, if you have minims available, you use for one patient and you dispose. But in, in the, again, this is another challenge that at times like this, the consumable flow is not, we, we are not getting, I mean, a lot of people are not able to bring in. So we are also looking at the possibility that later on there might be shortages in critical consumables. So we should be very careful, always use the, I mean, stay away from the patient, avoid the eyelashes, um, don't let the tip of the eye drop touch the patient, um, put the drops in a, in a cabinet where they can is, do not be easily um, inf infected. So going to surgery, the best thing is to test every surgical patient before you take the patients into surgery. That, that is the best thing. And then, where there's no suspicion or evidence of SARS-CoV, standard surgical PPE should survive. This, the standard PPE uh, should survive. And also for surgery, it's recommended that you use the N95 mask, which we do have um, quite some N95 masks. If a patient is positive, um, it's not likely that, uh, I haven't seen it. It's not likely that we're going to do surgery for a positive patient. That's just the summary. <laughs> what I'm, I'm saying. But you see, the problem is that they have, there is little availability to testing. There's little availability to testing. So, um, and again, asymptomatic patients are transmitting. So um, you might not be able to fully, uh, to fully 
um, identify patients. Our traditional COVID-19 iodine is still expected to be effective against envelope viruses of, uh, of which SARS-CoV is one at the 5% and the 10% that we use them, they are still expected to be effective. Um, Anti-VGF for, we have reduced to very, very minimal. I, I think we've hardly done maybe three or four. The concern now is that there has now been a longer period. We were thinking of two weeks, four weeks, now it's the period are uh, longer. And for patients, like patients with CRVO, um, patients with macro, diabetic macular edema can still tolerate some fluid. But those is severely ischemic um, retinal vein uh, occlusion patients, they, especially the CRV, they can't tolerate so much. So the pressure is, is coming from patients to consider, I mean, recommencing the injection. But, the truth is that it's better to stay safe, and we are pushing those um, those <laughs> those cases as far as we can. Um, the, the, we, we cannot run ahead of our society. We don't think. When I say society, I mean Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria is not running fast enough in the direction of finding a solution to this problem. So this problem might actually still be with us for quite some time. Um, however, we are trying to manage the patients, discuss with them, talk with them on um, have We actually set up Zoom meetings with patients and we're able to, to handle a few of them. So fecal emulsification, if you go to YouTube, you see a lot of um, videos that talk about the aerosolization that happens in fecal emulsification. But again, what I'm quoting here is the summary from the American Academy um, Committee on the possibility of aerosolization during FACO. And that is, it's possible. However, there are ways that it can be reduced uh, by using a, a, lot more, um, a lot more viscoelastic substances, reducing the incision size, not to use the large incisions, most of the aerosolization actually is uh, BSS. So it's advocated that one makes sure that um, in the preceding steps, you are taking out the whole aqueous and you make sure you have a full chamber fill of uh, viscoelastic so that if there's anything that will be coming out, it will not be the patient's aqueous. It's a similar thing for vitrectomy. The advantage for vitrectomy is that it's more enclosed, especially now that we're using trocars and cannulas. So we use um, trocars that are sealed, valved trocars. A valved stroker will allow your instrument to go in, but will not allow fluids to come out of the eye. So we're using valved strokers to do the vitrectomies. Um, all guidelines still say that um, patients with retinal detachment should be treated and not allowed to go um, to go blind. Of course, the, the PPE should be worn by um, everyone in the theater, including the face shields for, for everyone. Now, I must say that it's very, very difficult. It's very cumbersome wearing a face shield and trying to do surgery. Uh, that's why I use my, the, I showed it earlier on. I have the glasses, the protective one that have the shields. Because with the face shield, it's, it's difficult to be able to get your IPD and be able to get, because if you are going to do a retinal surgery, you need to, to have your um, binocular vision and you are not running into structures unnecessarily. Uh, so don't let's forget that we have to protect ourselves as uh, surgeons, wash our hands, alcohol-based or just simple soap and water keep a good distance, one meter between ourselves and um, avoid anyone that is coughing. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that we, because in our building we have lifts, so we have reduced the number of people that are not more than two people can go in the lift. We've opened all our doors so that people will rather use the staircase. And But the truth is that it, the challenge is not that the patients are not rushing to the hospital right now. We are probably having 10 to 15% of our volumes. So that has helped us to be able to ensure that the social distancing is taking place. But like Prof said, when the road is clear 
and people start rushing in, that's when that's when we we, we will probably be needing to get um, additional help. But we um, we think we started um, ahead and we're able to inform patients and let them know keeping their appointments coming alone, except uh, where absolutely necessary. Um, in terms of ethics, patients need to get uh, witnesses to their to their consent form. So for for surgical patients, we allow them to bring in someone that we witness. But I mean, there are not many. We're probably having just very, 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 very few numbers um, of surgery in a day. So thank you. Um, I'll be glad to share any questions, my references. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Odenrilo, for another brilliant talk. We've had very three very, very interesting and topical discussions. I, you'll agree with me that all the speakers were brilliant and spoke very well. And I think they spoke to me. You know, it's, it's very practical. It's what questions that I've been asking myself and I got a lot of answers from, from them. So um, what I'd like to do now is we are going to go into question and answers. It's going to be question and answers, but before then, if you're like me, I would like to, um, now, do another poll, of course. For those of you that know, if you can see your screen, can you see the poll on the screen? Okay, it says, do you feel better informed or confident to be working as a clinician in this COVID-19 period? So are you better informed? Do you know um, how to go about it? What really needs to be done? Or would you like to find out more? Of course, we always want to find out more. So I'll just give a few more seconds for voting, uh, 87%, 70% have voted. Ten more seconds and I'll be done. Okay, thank you very much. So this is what we voted for. Um, yeah, so at the beginning, I was, I had not, not really, you know, somewhat about 53%. And then now most of it is yes. So this is a, a nice to know. Um, I would just like to quickly share my screen so that we can go to question and answer. Um, okay, so I'm sharing my screen now and I've collated all the questions and answers. Um, before we go on, these are some of the resources that might, you might find useful to, for further reading. Guidelines and information of the ICO the NCDC website, the Community Eye Health Journal, and some blogs. So, um, Professor Ioni, yes. the first few questions will go to you. Please, let's try and be quick. We have really spent a lot of time. I, I plead your indulgence, both the attendees and the response, so that we can round up. So the first question is, thanks, Professor Ioni. Ethics is not law. But are there legal steps that can be taken on patients who intentionally withhold relevant information and put the physician at risk? Uh, I'd like a yes or no answer and a referral to where we can find more information on this because I think it's a discussion on its own. Unmute yourself, please. Unmute yourself.
So please unmute yourself. We can see you talking, but we can't hear you. The, your microphone is muted. I can't see the question on my okay, screen good. here. Can, can you help me read the question again? Can you see my screen? I'm sharing my screen. No, I can't see it. Okay, can can Prof? Can you see it? I I do Can you see my screen? You. Can you read out the question to Professor? Okay. Yes, you want me to read it out? The ethics is not law. But are there legal steps that can be taken on patients who intentionally withhold relevant? information and put the physician at risk. So I'll, I'll ask, I'll say the other questions. The second one is, I think a comment, he said HCP to stay safe. Then the third one is, in the absence of adequate and appropriate PPEs as stated in standard protocols, is it ethical for ophthalmologists or eye care workers to continue routine clinical or surgical work in any facility? Let, let, me, let me start from that last question. I don't mm -hmm. think uh, from all what uh, people have discussed here today, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the person asking the question, I know the, the answer must, must have been provided, but you can run routine uh, clinics now. Yeah. That's the blunt truth. You can run with a clinic now. But uh, I want uh, to uh, urge the, the person to engage the, his principals, to engage his principals to provide some uh, maybe PPE. Then I also want to say that uh, each one of us to also look inward. What can we do to make sure we provide them maybe partial services like uh, telemedicine as already uh, highlighted? Then there are, there are certain things you can do. You can give phone to some of uh, trusted patients. If you trust some patients, you can give your phone to them so that if they have anything that you can quickly sort out on phone. So in then, essence, uh, what you're saying is um, we shouldn't venture without protection you can do routine routine you can run routine clinic now okay thank you sir and i have more questions actually um what is a healthcare worker to do if there is a suspected case is it to request for testing and well and request for testing which is not done and there's no ppe so you're in a quagmire what do you do suspected case request for testing that was not done and there's no PPE. Don't do it. Honestly, if you have, if you suspect a particular patient, you refer to LCDC because uh, most, of, most of our uh, uh, teaching hospital or hospitals, they can't do all these tests. It is LCDC that does the test. So I think you can send the patient so that in the process of going to do it at the NCDC center, it doesn't transmit it to its contacts. It's only cancer yes, I think there's a clear NCDC. guideline. Yes, sir. I think there's a clear guideline um, mm -hmm. by NCDC on what to do in such a situation. Okay. So uh, I, I'm not sure if the fifth one is a question, is another, <laughs> is another presentation as well. Can yeah. Professor Ioni give a brief of what is required of an eye care provider as regard ethics? I think this was in the, in the presentation. Mm -hmm. Can I seek your indulgence to refer the person back to the presentation that you had just given since it was recorded? Okay. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Professor Anakoy, are some of the questions that were posted for you? Can you see my screen? Okay, yes, can, can you take them, please? Okay, um, the first one is just a minute. 
Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. How yes. convenient is it using the face shield to do a slit lamp examination and IOP measurement using a pecking stonometer? For well, slit lamp examination, it's quite easy. I mean, I do it uh, from time to time now. Uh, it depends on what you have as your face shield. There are some of those um, transparent film, you know, that are actually not so good. Once you've used it once and you clean, especially if you make a mistake of using alcohol to wipe it, then it becomes hazy. Um, I think the right thing to do is some of them just clean with soap and water. But I can tell you that it is convenient to do slit lamp fundoscopy with 78 or 90D with it. Um, with regards to pecking stonometer, I don't know how workable that would be. But if you have your shield on, your face shield on, well, just do gold man. You don't need to do Perkins. Perkins is even too close. It's too close. Just go for gold man. You don't need to do Perkins at this time. Please do not. And then two, it says the cases recorded could be related to the testing capacity of each state. I believe the cases are not necessarily new infections because if most of the country's population is tested, more cases will be recorded, especially, well, it's a comment, but it's important to note that even the asymptomatic cases, in the first one week, they shed a lot of virus. And that is what we are trying to avoid. And that is why I said every potential, every patient is a potential COVID patient, since you won't know if patient is asymptomatic. And then number three says, surgery should not be done for any patient without testing for COVID. I agree completely. That's why I gave the option because we may not be able to do the actual COVID testing, the RT-PCR, but you can send to the lab for IgM. IgM is a sign of a new infection. You do the IgM and the IgG and compare the two. If the two of them are high, then something likely is happening. Though it may not be COVID, it may just be some other infections, but at least if you have your suspicion, it's always good to err on side of caution. And then number four, um, life is definitely more important than sight, but what specific things do we do if a patient with ocular emergency, medical or surgical, is suspected for COVID during the triage? Of course, you call the infection um, department unit. That is when Professor Ayoni, he was talking about the holding unit. You see, in your triage area, you should have a holding place. If you have anybody that you suspect, you ask that patient to wait there so that the patient does not go in to contaminate or infect others. And then you contact your infection diseases unit in your hospital. At least that is the protocol that we have in our hospital. And then in a state where testing is not actively ongoing, so no case recording. Yes, we have two states in Nigeria, Kogi and Cross River. They said they don't have COVID in their Number state. five. Now. How should Pardon? It says, how should eye care services proceed? Of course, I have said it. Everyone is a potential. I COVID. think there's something there's going on. Okay, you can't hear. Hello? Hmm. Hello? We can hear you. We can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Okay. All right. So what I'm saying is anywhere in Nigeria, Every patient should be treated as potential COVID. It's immaterial whether you have a figure in your state or we don't have. We are concerned with the asymptomatic COVID patient. Symptomatic COVID patient will not come to the hospital. They stay at home. It is the asymptomatic that will come to us. And those are the ones we are worried about. There's what about several other the theater domestics? What about several theater without laminar flow of air? Instead, domestic air conditioners. Honestly, I'm thinking because the way our theaters are built with the air conditioners, it's an avenue for easy spread. So we may have to look into maybe looking for a way in which we can open out some of the windows while we still have a free flow of air. I don't know what. That's just my oh. thought. <laughs> so I think I think I'm done. Sorry, my speaker has got bonkers. Yeah. Okay. I think 
think he started, he started now. see patients until the clinic protocols are well established. Please don't see patients. The last question. Okay. Apart from... Okay, Sorry, I'm not sure where we are. Which oh, one? I, I think I lost you no. a bit. Yes, there's a page. Can I have that page? There's a page. Okay. I think you have two pages. Ma, have you tested all the? No, I've done. I've done four, five, six. Okay. No, the the numbers are jumbled up because I was trying uh, to. Yes. So let me. Together. I haven't done this yes. page. So raise this page. Have you tested all the staff in PDC? We have a protocol in place for regular testing of all staff in order to ascertain their exposure. No, so we have not tested all staff, but. A few, one or two or three people who thought, you know, they were ill, who had tests done were negative. The hospital has not got to that stage yet, but that is the plan. In fact, it should be the plan of every hospital. In the United Kingdom, I can see that uh, Bola, Dr. Bola Odufuwa is on. I'm sure she must have taken um, the COVID-19 test. All hospitals, it is mandatory for every staff to take COVID-19 tests. And I think we need to do that also in Nigeria. We are just talking symptomatically and you know, people are well. And also the fact that our exposure is very low with regards to the hospital, except people get it in the community. Now, what was the protocol for testing of staff? I've answered that. Then apart from IgG, those that were done, the tests that were done, they were done in the hospital, in our IDU department. Now, apart from IgG and IgM testing, are there any more affordable, available general screening tests that can be done on all surgical patients? IgG and IgM is the cheaper one or available one that I know, because I know you can go to the lab and get those done. I don't know of any other for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, Dr. Derule, you have quite a number of um questions. This is just the first page. There are about three pages. So if you can see how you can. Yes. And there's a lot on telemedicine. So uh, okay. let's see which ones you can take quickly. Okay. So number one is a comment. It's important to replace the lens in Humphreys. It's true. Like I said, if you go to the Zeiss website, you will see a very elaborate. It's not it's something you really have to sit down, study, and learn. It's a very elaborate cleaning process. It's on their website, and most other um, equipment manufacturers have that. Um, yes, we know that AMD, that's number two, AMD patients are not able to withhold, um, tolerate fluid. So uh, um, I think in most other places, yes, they continue the injections. Uh, on like um, GME, I'm not encouraging us to help them to tolerate fluid. When I mean fluid, I mean subretinal fluid that we are giving the injections for. So most AMD injections still in many areas go, go on, but we don't have so much AMD. Most of our patients are GME and vein occlusions. And like I said, um, there's a lot of pressure now on us to fully to resume giving the injections and we are trying to put the right protocols in place to start um, taking the injections back, but we have not yet fully started taking them back. How can we access the face shield in Lagos? Uh, it's the same one Professor Nokoya is using. <laughs> so <laughs> no, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you charge me privately, I will give you the name of the person I bought it from. If you send me a private chat, I'll give you the name. Um, if it's a, I'm, not the one selling, I'm not the one selling it. Um, cleaning agents dilute bleach. Yes, like I said, it, not only bleach, Hydrogen peroxide and um, and um, alcohol based, all of them, they sort of erode this equipment. That's what I'm, I'm saying. If you use it for long enough, you find out that, especially for tonometer heads, you find out that they are gradually eroding them. Yeah, but well, what do we do? Infection or keep it clean? I think the choice is ours. So um, with all this additional equipment, 
and that has to be provided in order to meet our clients' need and protect ourselves or those in private who bears the cost? Excellent question. So we also had a long discussion. Um, some of us were of the idea that we need to increase consultation and everything. But at the end of the day, we're not changing anything because it's going to be counterproductive um, if we, we decide to now raise our, our costs and um, that might actually send patients away rather than uh, get patients to the, to the hospital. However, that will be a decision for each practice uh, depending on the financials. But I will say this, the, aim, the financial aim of the practice now is survivor, it's not profit. You will be happy if you survive. So the aim here is survival, not profit. And anything that we can do to make sure we survive, I think it is worth it. Then maybe towards the end of the year, next year, we can now start thinking of how to make ourselves much more profitable. There are still a number of areas that I have not discussed. Staffing, you know, um, how do you get your staff? How do you pay your staff? You are not making money. There are more. So there's still a lot of things to, to consider. Um, Telemedicine. There are a lot of questions on telemedicine. Maybe you should yes. just pick them all together. Okay, so all the telemedicines, what we do first, we send a text message to, to our patients. We have a dedicated phone line. So they call that line, and there is uh, one of our residents that is manning it. He discusses with them. For those that he can handle, he handles. Those that he cannot, he will set up a Zoom meeting with the consultants who will now further discuss with them. Again, you have to control a lot of things. Some patients can hold you down for one hour. So you have to let them know that it's just a 10 minutes consultation. They, they need to get all their information written out and then um, you try and make sure that the consultation times out at the, so that you'll be able to take a, a number of, uh, of patients. So, that's what we are doing now. It's uh, we are learning. We are learning on the job. That's what I would say. Um, it's not excellence. There will be a, one or two hitches, but we've just done that to support our patients. Um, especially, many of them are really, really lost in in this, uh, in this situation. Yeah. So I, do you I charge for it? Somebody wanted to know. Okay, if I charge for the yeah, okay. So right now. We've started charging for it. In the first six weeks that we did it, we did not charge. We just did it free. But as the volumes are climbing and as expenditure on that is also climbing, we've started to attach some, some bill to it. Um, I, I can't see any other question. A lot of patients cannot see well, hence might need assistance to navigate. Is it possible to delegate hospital healthcare assistance Okay, so for patients who don't see well, um, the person accompanying them is, is the best person to help yeah. them to, to go through. Like I said, the numbers of patients coming in are still very low. So our waiting rooms are still able to take them with adequate spacing. But where we are looking at is when the door really opens. So for someone to still come in, um, come in with, the, with an assistant when he's not seeing well, I think it's still better that the relative will help him come in. That, that is my, I don't know if other facilities are doing differently. Um, I have so many other questions. I don't know who is going to take them um, appropriately, well, but- uh, For the residency training, postgraduate examination, are we going virtual as some exams are already pending? Well, we don't have information yet from the college, but the exam, we know it is pending. So just be patient. I'm sure in a few days we will have more information. And then considering asymptomatic carriers, do we still think that use of surgical mask by ophthalmologists in routine clinic, is that enough? I'm of the opinion that N95 mask respirator be used even in the clinic. What do you think? Well, I think that the standard surgical mask with the face shield should be enough. Not just the mask. If you must use N95 mask, if you use it, 
for comfort or for your own safety or for paranoia, then you'd have to wear goggle because you must cover your face. You must cover your eyes because there was a case that it was thought that it was through the eyes, droplets getting into the eyes that it got the infection. So we still have to protect the eyes. So that is why surgical mask with face shield, I think is adequate. N95 mask is quite expensive. We can reserve those for surgery. Then my CMD told us clinic are starting on Monday, but no PPE. I will not see patients until the clinic protocols are well established. Quite, quite uh, you, are, you are on the right path. I don't think you should see patients without adequate protection. Please do not. But you can go back and have a meeting with your CMD, online meeting. Don't do face to face. <laughs> Thank you. I think those are the only three that are there. Thank you very much. Any comments, Professor Ioni? Dr. Oderinlo, any comments? Any further comments? God help us. Yes, <laughs> I, have, uh, I have tried as much as possible to put all the questions that have been put forth. Um, yes, uh, yes, and all the questions in would, the question please, Will and anyone answer. be addressing children? Looking after children? Maybe you okay, should Okay, your question now. came. Mama, you have address. abandoned children. No, you, Mama, you can't. We are waiting for you to address it, Mama. Please you address that. <laughs> in fact, uh, um, right. Professor, Professor um, Popola, I was going to say, one of the... Um, institutions I was talking to because I was trying to find out as much information as I could, you know, they, they are doing emergencies on children. And incidentally, is a lot more during this season, especially trauma. Yes. So and they have carried out, carried on the services for trauma in children. So I was very curious to know what type of trauma, you know, um, whether it's because they have a lot of unorganized or unsupervised play, or maybe even child abuse, because yes. they spend a lot more time with adults now for longer periods in a closed situation. So maybe you can give us a little bit, two minutes, please, because we have really taken a lot of time. Well, it's I think that is very important. Trauma, trauma should be expected. Yes, yeah, trauma should be expected. But uh, my thought. Uh, they are even beyond trauma. For instance, if you look after kids and you have to do ROP, you have to do retinoblastoma, they're going to come with their tumor, they will continue to grow if you don't do something about it. In our part of the world, we like to do pele pele, you know, they'll be crying and you'll be examining them. That's not for a time like this. That's an important principle that all of us must carry. We must do whatever we can to ensure that the children are not crying and then spreading things all over the place. In fact, uh, what we have also done is when they come in, the, pair, the mother sits out and then we take the child from the mother, bring the child inside. If it's just a procedure that you can use oral chlorhydrate to sedate, if that's all you need to do, please go ahead and do that. But uh, we had to do laser for retinoblastoma during this period, which meant that, and the theater is not really fully up and running. I had to run to, hello, are you with me? Yes, okay. we are hearing you. Are you with me? Okay, we can I hear had to you. run to the anesthetist to ask, okay, I had to run to the anesthetist, what do I do? Because I had an enucleation for retinoblastoma, they were not ready to take it, and I understand they were really traumatized from a case uh, in the hospital. Then they told me how to use ketamine in the clinic. So going to work, I had a pulse oximeter in my pocket, took to the clinic, only one doctor, one nurse, and myself. And we did as they told us to do. We had the ample bag, we had the emergency tray, I checked them all out. I made sure I had pulse oximeter, we set the line, and we were able to do lasers for the children. So I think these are some of the things that we should look at, just make sure that they are not yelling and crying all over the place. Because they probably have come from all sorts of places. And you, it's hard to send them back. 
And whatever we are also doing, uh, Professor Nokoya described the kind of things they wear. You should also make sure you wear that while examining the children. The parents should wear masks, definitely, if they must come close enough to anybody. Even the person going to pick the child from them would have to come close enough. So the mothers know they have to wear that, wash their hands, wear your gloves, like uh, Dr. Daniel Law described, wear the, the PPE, and then please make sure they are not crying. When you are doing procedure, give them something to sleep and then you do your... But for routine surgery, they are also on hold. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a few more questions, I think, which are pertinent quickly. Uh, Professor Onakoya, are refractions currently being done at Luth? No. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, then there was another question on... Our theater rooms don't have windows. How do we ensure cross ventilation? Whereas, I, I, as I said, you know, this situation, this COVID 19 is a disruptor. <laughs> so it, it makes us go back to the drawing and board. It's yeah. <laughs> yes. So we should go back to the drawing board, design our theaters the way they should be, design our <laughs> clinics the way they should be, you know, at least reorganize yes. some of these things. And this is the time to begin to think about these things. So we've addressed um, the children. And um, I think we have had a very good and interesting um, discussion here. It took a lot longer, so two yes, hours. Thank you all. Thank you very much for your attending, for everybody for attending, for the brilliant questions, for the interesting questions that have jacked up the discussion. Um, and I will hand over to Dr. Ogutipe to give us the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a very stimulating session. Uh, on the last question, I just need to add that there are some uh, portable, movable uh, extractors, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. There's one in our theater in usage. I'll try and get the details and post through various ones so that if we can get that to buy, it will help us along with the uh, air conditions. Uh, I would like to congratulate our uh, speakers for job well done and to thank them specifically. Each one of them has been wonderful. Uh, there is a group of Nigerians, uh, the Nigerian of the uh, group, uh, Dr. Bola Odufua uh, is one of them. I think we shall extend our next uh, a webinar invitation to them, and maybe I'll tell the, the maybe the scientific committee can find a slot for them sometime in the future to share their dreams and aspirations with us uh, in this group and help, to help us move ahead. Uh, Dr. Kiari, please take note of that. Uh, Dr. Professor Nokoya, thank you very much. Uh, keep the good work up. Thank you. Uh, the medical director in the waiting, or uh, the, the Keja medical director. How are you? Thank you very much. You've done a wonderful job. Uh, we won't make the mistake of calling you chief medical director until the appropriate time. <laughs> thank you very much. Well done. Professor Ioni. Like also... Okay. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes, Professor Ioni. Thank you very much. And. Uh, I was going to thank the chairman of the uh, scientific committee, but she seems to have something to say. Maybe I should, she should say it before I thank her. No, I, I still have comments don't stop coming, but I think we have to give it a break at some point. But this one is from the Secretary General of the OSN. And he said, um, we should all acquaint ourselves with the provisions of the National Health Act, especially part three, section 21. It addresses the rights and obligations of users and health personnel. So we should go and um, look at the National Health Act so that we can acquaint ourselves. Uh, it's very important. Um, and before you go on, please, I'd like to also personally thank Dr. Bola Odufwa for, for being on this um, watching and making comments, very important comments. And um, 
I'd like to say we have almost another hundred people watching by YouTube, and they are applauding. They have um, they are clapping. Uh, you can actually see them clapping, <laughs> and they are saying thank you very much for the brilliant talks. All the talks were very informative and useful, and um, you can see all the other comments here. So I'm happy that um, everybody that watched it felt that it was worth their time. Thank you very Back much. You, I don't know if you picked my uh, request when I was talking about Bolo before, because I saw you thinking her again, uh, that there is a diaspora ophthalmology group of Nigerians, and that uh, we may extend this webinar and give them a slot sometime in the future. And we should be inviting them uh, regularly when we are having the webinar. Uh, I hope you got the message, Dr. Kiari. Yeah. Okay, all right. I, I so, got it, I got it. Dr. Kiari has been a wonderful resource person for this uh, webinar. We had some issues uh, at various levels, and each time she rose stoutly to help us uh, to get ourselves uh, in the clear. We are using a platform that she has generously uh, allowed us to use. Even she has to pay some extra dollars to allow, to allow us to use it. Uh, the Ophthalmological Society of Nigeria has subscribed to Zoom. So our next meeting, by the grace of God, will be on that uh, platform. Uh, on the note of this, I'd like to thank everybody for taking their time to watch and be part of this webinar. I have been thoroughly educated and I believe most of us have been educated. I could hear Dr. Kiari saying that uh, that lecture was speaking to me. It spoke to a lot of us and uh, let us just don't be spoken to, let's take it up and run with it so that it will be better for us, for our community. And we steer ourselves healthy out of this crisis and by the grace of God, the new normal that we are looking forward to, we shall leave it well. Thank you very much, everybody, and God bless. Bye.